Nice to see you, Bobby. Thank you, Michael. Nice to have you with us. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, a pleasure. On behalf of your legion of fans, great to see you so fit and well in your mid-50s, but more of that later. It's nearly 24 years since that fateful day at VFL Park Waverley. Have you moved on? I think I was over at day one, to be honest. Uh, I, I live a life of no regrets. Um, sure, the pain was there straight after the game. Uh, reflection of everything that happens in life and football. I, I tend to think that uh, there's always tomorrow and move on. And uh, my motto always has been, life goes on, so get over it and get on with it. So I don't look back at it with any regrets. You finished the 87 preliminary final with a busted collarbone. Would you have tried to play in the grand final? Yeah, well, Dipper popped it uh, in the second quarter, to be honest. So I went off for injections and uh, tapings and so on and so forth. It uh, happened in those days. You try and get back out in the field as quick as you could. Uh, to play the next week would have taken a lot of work, uh, probably genius work by the medical staff. They would have uh, really needed to put some painkiller in there, make sure that it wouldn't drop out. It was a, it was a popped shoulder, so it's, the ligaments just made it fall away and I went over to Vancouver to play football later in in the October period and had trouble actually playing there so to play a week later would have been doubtful. How did you blokes feel looking back when you realised that Jimmy Stein's running through the Buccanara mark had probably cost you a chance to play in a premiership? Jimmy who? <laughs> uh, oh, Jimmy Stein's yeah. Um, Jimmy was uh, the unfortunate end result of a day that uh, probably looked as if we could have won it at any time during the day. And the first quarter I took a mark uh, 15 metres out, if that, on a slide angle, had a shot for goal and hit the guy, tipped it on the mark. So it goes through for a point, put that back on the score line and where do we sit? So never look at isolated moments within a game. And whilst frustrating it was, the, the, the siren had actually gone before the ball arrived with Bacanara and you know the umpire never heard it the crowd all heard it and there was a tremendous roar but this game should have been over before is that we... right i wasn't aware of that. so the ball was in the air yeah when the siren sounded yeah and the umpires hadn't heard it and it's still over when jimmy ran across the mark so really there was no need for him to go and pick, pick up an extra man if the umpire had a sound of the siren there wouldn't have been a 15 meter penalty so all those things culminated into a, an incident that I think it's become pretty famous as a game of football, particularly in my life, but in Melbourne supporters, people still come up to me and talk about the 87 prelim. needs to kick this to put Hawthorne in the grand final. He's done it! Hawthorne have made it! Uh, my last game of football mm. ever, not making the grand final for the first time since 1964. Things that, you know, really, I, was, I had a, a fantastic year in 87 to actually get to the finals, so there's a lot of things adding up to that. We saw the fury from John Northey, the coach after the game, with that famous picture where he pointed his finger at Jimmy, and I was in the crowd with Melbourne pe supporters just crying, just, just couldn't control their emotions. I'm surprised that you were able to move on so quickly after that. Yeah, well, uh, when, when I look back at my career, my ambition, you know, you start off a football career and you think, oh, if only I can play for the Melbourne Football Club. That was my ambition in life. I used to you know, sit there in school and dream about it. Then to play for the football club was about getting a game the next week. Once you cement, it becomes about making the finals. So I played a career from 1973 to 87 without playing one final. Mm -hmm. And it was the ultimate. But there was nothing I can do about it once you didn't. I couldn't change it, I couldn't you know, go back. So all you have in your mind is bitterness if you're going to live like that. And I, you look forward to the next challenge and what you, you need to do. And it just so happened the next thing that was a challenge, the next year we played in the grand final. Albeit that I wasn't there, um, but I wasn't saddened by it. I was, uh, sorry, I was probably a little bit saddened by it, but I wasn't bitter about it. In your 15 years at Melbourne, you won 105 of 333 games. That's a rate of less than one in three. Uh, that's uh, a very, very lean period in a footy club history. It was, it was. Uh, but it, I can honestly say that in the years I played, I always would think that we were going to win the game of football. 
I'd arrive at the ground, regardless of who we're playing, thinking that we're going to win the game. I'd, I'd go there preparing myself to be victors of the day. And that was me mentally prepping to play well, but also hoping that the other guys within the team would be doing the same to actually win the game of football. Your first game, it must have been an interesting experience. You're still at school, you're playing football for the club that you grew up barracking for, and you didn't know any of the players. Tell us about that. Well, I was only 17 still at school, and I remember uh, we were um, on, at home over the Thursday night. We used to wait for the league teams to come across, and they were on the radio. And Noel McMahon, chairman of the selectors, actually rang my place and got Dad on the phone. I was in the lounge room, Dad's in the kitchen. Dad's going, look, Noel, he's thin. You know, I don't think he's ready for this. I, I don't know if I'm going to give permission for him to actually play. But finally got convinced that I was going to play in the senior sides for the first time in my life. The only prior, I hadn't had any prior uh, preparation with the si senior side. I trained with the under 19s, played with the under 19s, got promoted to three games, one as an interchange, then two full games in the reserves, and all of a sudden I'm thrust into the senior side. I hadn't met the players, I knew who they were, I barracked for them, I loved them. So to walk in the rooms was a, a dream. To, to actually walk in and be amongst them in the first place and then let alone play with them. So you came to the ground with your parents? Yeah, came with mum and dad yeah. and uh, we, we arrived at the gate just outside the change rooms. Um, I hadn't trained with the side so hadn't, hadn't been to the club since I'd been to under 19s training um, during the week. So that I didn't have any tickets to get in, I only had under 19 tickets. Um, so we paid our way in and got into the, into the rooms and Barry Burke grabbed me, took me around and introduced me to all the players. Who was your hero just before you, uh, well you, you ended up playing with lots of heroes I suppose. Yeah, well, when I was a, a kid I grew up with number four on my back and number four in the 60s was John Lord. Mm -hmm. um, Big John Lord, who had bald head Ruckman, and, uh, and I do remember the story, and Lord, you'll probably hate me for this, but uh, he, he had to change his strides out on the ground one day because they got ripped, and uh, he had more hair on his bum than he did his head. <laughs> <laughs> had the jock strap on. Him. But love made uh, good mates with Lord, he's been fantastic. Uh, then Tony Sullivan had number four after that. Tell us about your relationship with Ron Barassi. Good, very good. Um, he, he really, Barassi, was fantastic for the football club because he turned our football club around from being an amateur organisation uh, under the auspice of uh, the Melbourne Cricket Club, um, while still under the auspice of the Cricket Club, turned into a professional organisation on and off the field. He went back to grassroots with us, teaching us how to kick, how to handball left hand and right hand. Um, we'd have to do drills, 100 left hand handball, 100 right hand handball, left foot kick, right foot kick before we actually went out and did our work. Um, you had to be prepared right um, in a lot of things, uh, little things in football, things when you haven't got the ball, uh, prepped you for life in your, your time management and the way you went about things with people in life. So in the, in the package of life and football, he was fantastic for me and, and I appreciate it. He was very harsh though too in the same breath that, that he was, the expectation of success was enormous. So he was teaching us to do it right and that was the expectation that you had to do. If you didn't do it right, what he'd ask you to do, then he'd be down on you like a ton of bricks. Healy off, Ellingworth on! Bloody weak as piss. I mean, don't look at me like that. How many kicks have you got? That's the answer to everything. Possessions. You give me possession and I'll shut up. Why did he move you from a wing, which was your province, to the halfback flank. Look, I, I love the wing because it, it, I thought the wing was a great position because it was a tactical position because you had to read the play and understand where the ball was going to go and make a judgment on whether you went forward or back, whether you could be attacking or be defensive, whether you moved across the other side of the ground or stay on your own side of the ground. And it was in an era a lot different to today's football. So I enjoyed that with the tactical and the abilities that I had to enable me to actually be attacking and then have the, the thought process that I need to defend at some stage. And there's a lot of great women around. But what was happening, was I was getting tagged um, frequently, or almost every week. So Brass decided it, it changed that and make me tag someone else for a period when it was needed to be off the halfback flank. So I would mind someone, their thought process as a half forward would be attacking, which would allow me, when the time was right again with the, with the thought process, to be an attacking halfback flanker. And, 
and the logic was quite sound. And, and I played halfback, frankly, in 1983 and ended up um, in third in the Brownlow medal in that year. You went back to the halfback flank and you went further back at one point, didn't you? You went back to fullback and played on Malcolm Blight. Interesting experience. <laughs> did, you have to, did you have to say that? <laughs> um, Just take us through that yeah, minute by minute, look, will you? Um, there, there was only two minutes of it <laughs> because uh, Brass in the side at the time was Tiger Croswell, who was at full forward, and I, he's put me at full back on Malcolm Blight. And uh, my job was actually, you know, play play on him and stop him kicking goals. Well, the first three minutes, Jimmy Cracker and Phil Cracker got the ball out of the set. The first two minutes, all I remember was Brassy sending the runner out, uh, Tiger to full back and me to full forward. So I slunk around the boundary <laughs> line as Tiger Croswell come charging down the middle of the ground to take up the position at full back. So. Well, very short-lived. And now I know you came into football as a strapping 69 kilo player. What, is, what was your weight sort of when you, you know, matured and played probably uh, in the last five years of your career? Uh, 73 to 75. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah uh, look, our, our facilities. They talk about facilities in football club and how great and grand they are. Our facilities here were quite dismal. We had our changing rooms here at the MCG and they were very small and antiquated. That We had a four-way rotational piece of equipment that was our gym and a few uh, heavy weights that you could actually do some, uh, do some weights with and I wasn't big on the weights. So. But we actually at times had to train around the cricket pitch and at times actually trained in the car park. So um, for a, a club that's at the pinnacle or the top of the tree as far as the sport goes, to have those facilities was quite dismal. This time it's Flower. This is the good football with Flower's goal. Straight through. Flower breaks the tackle. Great football. Watch this one. Yes, what a fine goal. One of your ex-teammates, Greg Wells, described you as a pull-through when you arrived at the Melbourne Footy Club. I think you were a strapping 69 kilos. It was a tough year at the time. How did you stay out of trouble? Look, I've got knocks, there's no question, but I think you know, awareness was a, a strength of mine, that be aware of what's around you. So I, could, I had good peripheral vision to know that, that if I'm going for the ball, they're aware of everyone's position and what they're likely to do. So that was an advantage. Um, but I, I think I was hopefully, and you know, I put it down to be respected, that no one really come the crunch on me. Take us back to Whitten Oval, round 22, 1987. Tell us about that. Absolutely my favourite memory of my career uh, because it's, it was the culmination of everything to make actually make the finals. And that, it was that game that got us into the finals. And it was touch and go because it was five, five teams going to make the finals. Three, to, three teams were still vying for that fifth spot. And one of them was Footscray who were playing. The other one was Geelong who were playing Hawthorne who was the top side. So the the results at the end of the day were going to determine who made it. So I went there going out to Footscray, knowing it was going to be my last game of football if we lost, but hopefully my best game of football because we could make the finals and continue my career. So driving out there was very mixed emotions of where it was going to end up. And um, at half time, I'm, I'm in the room saying this is going to be the worst day because I hadn't had a touch of the football. I really, I may have touched the ball twice in a half of football. You are playing on Greg Ebelston. Greg Ebelston was yeah. my opponent who'd had the better of me throughout the year. A uh, very tough, dogged player and I've spoken to him since that game and a lovely guy by the way. But there were enemies on the football field. And I came out and remembered half time, you know, really angry going back out on the ground needing to do something. And thankfully in the third quarter I, I kicked a couple of goals that uh, put us into a position to win the game and kick the first goal of the last quarter. And then Brian Wilson and Ricky Jackson and Stephen Stretch and um, Newport and players were you know, doing things that were fantastic that put us in a position with five minutes to go to win the game of football. Three quarter time, when we got to three quarter time, we wanted to know the results down at uh, Geelong because they were, if we didn't win the game or if we did win the game and Geelong won, they were going to go in the finals anyhow. They were going to jump over the top of us. So the, the team manager, John Sell at the time, did tell us, don't worry about this result. All you need to do is win because down at Geelong, they're getting thumped. <laughs> <laughs> and we went out motivated to go and win our game. When we were so far in front, we, we thought we were in. But halfway through the last quarter, or towards the end of the last quarter, the crowd erupted and we thought the game was over. And it was actually Dunstall, um, everyone on their transistors listening to the Geelong game, Dunstall uh, kicked a goal to put Hawthorne in front. 
<laughs> that was the day Gary Lyon broke his leg, wasn't it? Gary Lyon broke his leg yeah. uh, in the first quarter, carried him off, and uh, it was in his first year, and uh, he, he was sadly missed. Now, one of the most amazing stats in the Melbourne history is that a chap named R. Flower topped the goal kicking three times and won just one best and fairest. I, mean, I still find that uh, hard to comprehend. What, I wasn't a good goal kicker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked you in front of goal. But, uh, I mean, I've talked to you about this privately before, the fact that you won only one best and fairest. Is there any resentment? Uh, no, no resentment again. Life goes on. You can't do anything about it. Um, I think I run her up uh, a lot of times. Uh, but we had some really good players going through. Laurie Fowler won three, and he was a, a tough, tenacious. And best and fairest are team players that um, play what the coach wants and how he wants and, and looked at by the match committee in that manner. And you know, uh, you, know, you had to play, I, I didn't have any season, I think maybe one season where I only played the full 22 rounds of matches. So you miss a game and a, a couple of games and it's costly, whereas a Brownlow, that type of award, you can only poll in 10 or 11 games, but in a home and away season of a football club, you poll in every game. And so someone playing 22 rounds versus someone that's playing 18 does have an advantage. Been saying that, you know, we really did have some good players, you know, Stephen Smith and Gary Baker and Stephen Nick and Alan Johnson, all great players. And I've got no, no qualms about finishing behind any of those players. What did you think was a miss at the place at the time? There, there's certainly some, something to say about um, being prepared. And what, the, you, weren't, you weren't well prepared? I, I, the facilities that we had to prepare um, didn't put us in the best light. I don't think we were um, badly coached by any means. That you know, Bobby Skilton certainly had that window of opportunity to, to get into the finals. Um, Dennis Jones we didn't, he was only one year coach. Carl Dietrich was the, a playing coach. Then Brassy came along that went back to went backwards before we went forward. And when we did make the finals, I think it had a lot to do with Brassy's good work in the preparation for John Northey to actually let that bloom and follow on. And Swoop was great with that. Carl Dietrich, the coach, Robert. Uh, it seemed to me that every time he was on the ground, you blokes stood a lot taller. Definitely. If you if you had a look at your stats on the winning losing record, if Carl Dittrich is actually playing, we had a better chance of winning. And if he wasn't playing, Melbourne didn't ever win a game if he was at the club when when he wasn't playing. So he did make people stand tall. He did he he, he cast a shadow, well that was his nickname, the shadow, yeah. a, upon everyone, opposition and teammates alike because of his stature and, and the way he played the game of footy. You finished third in two Brownlows, 1979, 1984, both times behind Peter Moore. Should you have won a medal? I look back at um, one the, the second year and I think, gee, I, I was only a bee's knee away from winning a Brownlow, but I remember two games where I probably shouldn't have got votes. So mm. I'm probably well, miles have. away. Mm. I shouldn't have got votes. So it's all conjecture and again, Life goes on, I've got no regrets with that. Stop being such a good guy. Say there no, were two I, games you should no, have got votes. I, well, I, there probably might have been games, but I know there was one game where I, very ordinary for, um, you know, average for three quarters and kicked four goals in the last quarter and got three votes. So it wasn't a best on the ground performance for four quarters. The one thing, the other thing about your statistical background that surprised me, you've kicked more than 300 goals. I mean, that, that's a good return from a bloke who played primarily on a wing and, and even half back. Yeah, uh, I think um, the joy, one of the joys of football is actually kicking goals. Um, the culmination of what you're trying to do, again as a team, kick goals. And I had the freedom and coaches gave me the freedom to actually slot down into the forward line when it did. So the ball's tracking down the other side of the ground to actually float in, um, take a short pass or a, a mark down the goal square or even kick from outside 50. State games, 15 of them. I watched you play them, you're a sensational state player. Must have been sort of like your grand finals, were they? Oh, they, were, they were great um, moments in, in my life in that I got to play a game. Like, whilst coming to Melbourne playing with the guys I admired, playing in state football was the next level up again with the guys that you admire. So to be alongside you know, Schimmelbush and Duell and Dempsey and these guys that were legends of the game, and here I am again, I was humbled by being in the same room as them. And it was awesome playing in that, you know, all you had to do was be in the right position because you knew Bruce still on the halfback flank was going to get it to you somehow. 
or Jeff Southie or Kelvin Moore in the full back line, or if you got down the forward, it was going to be delivered in the right way because all you had to read the play and be in the right spots, and that was fantastic. And we had some, uh, you know, the, the the way, although I made lots of great friends out of state football that I continue to see, and you know, Bernie Quinlan I, I play golf with regularly, and um, all these guys that you, know, you just love being with in that time. And Melbourne guys the same, but it was a, a different level again. A lot of great wingers played when you were playing on the wing. Was there one that you had sort of an ongoing battle with? Uh, Wayne Schimmelbush uh, was a tough opponent, and because he was, he was unusual, he wasn't just a skilled, gifted footballer. He was dour and tough and rugged and would never give in, regardless of where the result of the game may well be, whether the first quarter or the last quarter, north miles in front, north miles behind. He was there doing what he had to do, and, and that was a, the, a trait of his that I admired. I want to ask you about a couple of uh, teammates of yours. One, Jared Healy. A uh, best and fairest winner at Melbourne, and suddenly he's gone, gone to Sydney where he won three best and fairest. How did he get away from the footy club? Jared did leave the club uh, to go to Sydney, and you know I was unsure of the circumstances, but I could see ourselves on the cusp of going somewhere and felt that it was important, so I wasn't happy that he left. Um, and that was 1986, that he, or might have been earlier, that he went to Sydney to play in looking for success. Um, and when we made the finals in 87, um, we played Sydney and knocked them out of the finals. And Greggy's younger brother was playing with us. And I think we were you know, secretly happy, not to only be Sydney, that Jared actually missed the, the finals to continue on. Uh, but a great footballer and a very much innovative in his own way. Um, I used to take uh, clinics, go to football clinics where we'd go to schools and clubs and, and take drills. And that was part of the culture of the uh, VFL or AFL in those days. When Jared came along, there were fantastic sessions to run because he'd think of things to do that were not just handball and kicking. And one of the examples I use is the peripheral vision. He had a drill that we concocted together in a, in a way of doing a peripher peripheral vision where you'd stand with facing one way and people would come down the other and we'd set up cones to see where you'd actually notice them arriving. So the ball would come to you, you weren't allowed to look anyway, but you had to shoot a handball out when you actually saw them in your vision. So you're practicing your per peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. Never seen it done before. Mark Jackson was another interesting player that you played with at Melbourne. Did you have an altercation with him at any point? Uh, it wasn't in the rooms, it was actually out on the track, uh, in, in a game. In a ja game? Yeah, Jacko was, uh, I knew Jacko, he lived in the local area and I had sporting, sporting goods stores out at Forest Hill and he'd come in the shops and interact with the kids and do all those things. And then he came to Melbourne, or he was at Melbourne, and one practice match, Ray Jordan and, and uh, Ron Brassy coaching, took us over the uh, the old Scotch grounds where we had a practice match. The, the thirds with Jordan with coaching was on one label, we are on the oval, inter, intra club. Well, Brassie had me at full back on Jacko. The ball came down, I punched the ball away. The ball came down, I'd knock it around him and, and take off. The ball came down, I marked he turned around and clocked me. <laughs> so with that, there was uh, nearly every player on the field mm. was in a melee with me holding the ball and Jacko taking on everyone else. <laughs> so it became a, a famous instance where Brassy said to Jacko, Jacko, this isn't what we're about playing footy here. It's a practice match. And Jacko's response was, I'm practicing how I play. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your health. You're in your mid forties and suddenly you learn that you've got a prostate problem, serious prostate problem. Tell us about that. Well, you, you know very well uh, what happened there, Michael, because uh, you were the one that instigated a, a test at my age. Um, I was very naive to any type of illness, and uh, the male ego says that you can actually beat any type of illness. And you suggested after a, a cancer golf day that cancer in men over 40, uh, the possibility of prostate cancer. And I didn't even know I had a prostate, let alone <laughs> have the cancer. And you were relaying to me about a story of one of your colleagues at work that had just gone through uh, prostate cancer and urged me to have a test next time I was at the doctor. So two weeks later, I was just getting my cholesterol checked and uh, I suggested to the doctor that I'd uh, be checked for prostate. A lovely lady said that I should and sent me to a urologist which did the, the normal testing, which is a, an internal examination along with the blood test. 
and lo and behold, uh, I've got cancer. The options that uh, was given, were given to me by my urologist was that I could get the prostate taken out and hopefully take the cancer with you. Uh, you could leave it and take potluck and see if it grows any further and, and uh, the repercussions of that and the danger of having prostate cancer that moves to other parts of the body. Uh, and then in your bladder, your, um, your bowel, other areas associated and it becomes uh, you know, your death sentence basically. So uh, the other one was having radiation therapy. And uh, you know, with uh, consultation with my doctors and family um, and the serious effect it has on, on your sex life that, that you, we, we went down, um, get it out and live to see your kids grow up. Now tell me just your, your love affair with football. What, I mean, as you started as a kid, probably it came on you much quicker than you would have thought. Is it still a passion for you? Uh, I, I love watching it and, and being there, but I don't think it's a passion of having to be at every Melbourne game. Um, I think yeah, you, when you grow out of football and your family comes along, I like watching my kids play their sport. I love watching my kids play their sport. So I, I like having the option of, I'd like to go to the football and watch it, or I'd like to do this and something else. So. That, that's taken away from the full-on commitment of being there every week and every second of, of a game of footy. And seriously, I, you know, watching Brad play his footy when he, when he was here and the girls play their netball was a big thing in my life. Great to see you, Tulip. Great to see you looking so well. Enjoy the chat and good luck for the rest of your life. Thank you, Michael. Sprints away, sprints up on the right, slams a goal, great goal, Robert Black.